making oh, sure we go live to the social media platforms. So we get more and more folks, which is really nice. Incredible, the internet. While we're waiting uh, for Noel to bring us everybody in, I just wanna give you a heads up. We are gonna have another new program. Uh, this is the book for it. It's The Road Back to Christ by Father Stavros Akrotirianakis. Say that fast five times. Uh -huh. Stavros Akrotirianakis. And you can get that online uh, through Amazon. And that will be one of the series that we're also gonna begin. It's a series of reflections that he wrote and we're really blessed to have people like Father Stavros and of course, Mr. Teragini, who are really able to dive down deep into our faith and unpack it for today's world. So we're very grateful to them. We ready to go, Noel? Yep, ready to go. Okay, to all you. Hello, welcome to your Myosian community. My name is Noel, and I will be moderating today's Let's Talk program. We love hearing from you around the world. Please use the sidebar chat to share where you're joining from. We ask that you invite others to join my OCN community. We are a welcoming community, one web, one faith, one community, OCN. A few reminders, please be respectful and polite with the opinions of others. Please remain muted when you aren't speaking. Um, you can write your questions and comments in the sidebar and we'll have some time to share those questions later. This is a live program. It's being shared on my OCN Facebook and it's also being recorded. So this video will be up on the website later. I'll share the link in the chat box in case you want to share the recorded video. The Orthodox Christian Network is a 501c3 corporation and a 100% donor supported ministry. We are the premier platform promising access to the fullest life through a timeless faith. My OCN community continues to be an anchor for the past 26 years to hold us in place so we can have faith over fear. Nearly three in 10 Americans, 28% report stronger personal faith because of the pandemic. And the same share think that the religious faith of Americans overall has strengthened. OCN is providing free membership to my OCN community, radio, video, and articles, and now a new quarterly virtual magazine, which released its first edition, was it last Monday? This past Monday. Yep, this past Monday. All right. And so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Father Chris. Thank you, Noel. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our board members, volunteers, and those folks who have joined the Myosian community. As Noel said, uh, you can go to our website and you can sign up for the newsletter. So you'll receive uh, reminders whenever we have the current programs and of course, announce some of our new programs. We wanna thank those of you that have supported us. You can do that tonight uh, during this conference or you can do it later on by going to myocn.net. If you're enjoying the program, we also hope that you will invite your friends the best way to spread orthodoxy, believe it or not, is to give it away. So it's not about holding it to us, it's about how we share it. Let's have an opening prayer and then I'll introduce our special guest and we'll start our conversation. I've lit my votive candle, as you know, I, I light that on each of our meetings and I'm pretty much surrounded now with icons. Uh, my family has helped me put up and made this small little studio. We're actually broadcasting from the condo that I live in now. Heavenly King and Comforter, the spirit of truth, everywhere present and filling all things, the treasure of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us of every stain and save our souls, O gracious one. Amen. Dr. Vienia Costandino holds five degrees in theology. She has been a professor at Orthodox institutions, including Holy Cross and Patriarch Athena Goros Orthodox Institute. For the past 18 years, she has taught biblical studies and early Christianity at the University of San Diego. She also currently teaches New Testament at two graduate schools of theology, the Franciscan School of Theology and St. Athanasius and Cyril Coptic School of Theology. She has been a regular speaker at conferences and retreats all over the country for the last 40 years. Her most recent book, which is the one we're talking about, Thinking Orthodox, Understanding and Acquiring an Orthodox Christian Mind was recently released and you can purchase that online at amazon.com. The subject is why the Orthodox Church is the continuation of the original ancient church and why it is different from Western Christianity. In our discussion with Dr. Vienia on her book, 
She will explain some of the common characteristics tonight of the Western Christian mind. What characterizes Fronima, the mindset of the Roman Catholic and Protestant Christians? Why did a different Fronima or mindset develop in Western Europe? And does that affect how Protestants and Catholic Christians communicate with those of us Orthodox Christians, or maybe even create difficulties understanding each other? Welcome, Evgenia. Nice to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Father. Thanks for inviting me again to participate. It's a pleasure. Again, I want to plug your book because it's excellent. Fun. This book has about three years of graduate theology in it <laughs> that I studied. And I have to tell you, it was much easier to pick up one book than it was to carry the briefcase and that oh, backpack yeah. <laughs> I used to carry all over the place. So last week, uh, last time rather, we discussed what Fronima is. Um, a biblical word that describes one's attitude, mentality, mm -hmm. even our approach. It involves both one's manner of thought and as you taught us, a way of life. So let's talk tonight about the Protestant and the Catholic Fronima and what distinguishes the two. I'll give it to you. Okay, so both Catholicism and the Protestant tradition come from the West and they developed very differently and developed a different way of thinking from what the early church had, which is what we still preserve. And a lot of that had to do with a different situation in Western Europe in which the church grew up in, in the West. So if you think about it, the circumstances were quite different. So the Orthodox church developed in the East and well, the, the first church, when it was just the church, the church was in the east, right? And there were a lot of cities already in the east. That's where civilization was. So we find it difficult today to um, imagine a time when Western Europe was completely uncivilized, but that's the case because civilization was in places like Alexandria, Egypt, Athens, Ephesus, Antioch. That's where the population centers of the Roman Empire were not in Western Europe. The city of Rome was on the fringe of the, you know, sort of developed world at that time. So when the Bishop of Rome began to really look westward because after Rome fell and um, there was still, of course, the empire in the East, the bishops of Rome still considered them parts of themselves to be parts of the empire, but they, be, they realized that they couldn't really rely on any kind of assistance for the East. And they also realized that there's all this territory that needed to be Christianized. Mm -hmm. So they began to send missionaries there and it was very difficult because there were no cities and there was no, um, even though there were lots of different, very pagan, very wild tribes. This was very forested. There, were, it was, there was no uh, structure already in place, no infrastructure for growing the church. So the, pape, so the popes became themselves much more powerful. They had to be more assertive. They became the real only authority in the West. And then this, because of that and because of some of the theology which had developed in the West by St. Augustine, um, they began to take a very different trajectory toward imagining church hierarchy, church authority, uh, the, 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 the way theology was done and things like this. So it's because they have a very different history and we just continued the way we were that the West developed quite differently than the East. There are a couple of names that uh, pop up in your book, um, mm -hmm. Augustine, Anselm, and yeah. Thomas Aquinas. Yep. Uh, those pop up as I would imagine that break off from Orthodox, from Catholicism yes. into Protestantism. Could you go into that a little bit for us? Sure, absolutely. So. Um, First of all, when we, we talk about the West, they come from the same mentality. So even though Protestants and Catholics differ with each other about uh, their opinions about things like sin, salvation, the church, nonetheless, they're coming from the same mind. They have the same approach and they're arguing always over the same things. We don't have the same kinds of arguments. We don't frame things in the same way that Catholics and Protestants do. So they have a very similar mentality. They're two sides of the same coin. They're not, it's not that they're opposite each other. They just don't agree on their opinions, but the way they theologize it, and the things that they argue about are exactly the same, whereas it's different for us. So 
the roots really of this difference in theology between the East and the West really goes down to St. Augustine. And it wouldn't have been so much of a problem. So let me just go back by talking about who he was. So St. Augustine, who is a saint and a father in the Orthodox Church, um, was a person who didn't have any theological training. He was very brilliant. He was trained as a rhetorician, as a philosopher. And this is how he earned his living for a, for a long time. Then he became a monk. And because he was so brilliant and so well-educated, he would, they made him a priest and then eventually a bishop. And he had to answer a lot of theological questions and interpret the Bible. And he did the best he could, but he wasn't always equipped to do that because he had no training in this. So he applied his thinking, which was philosophical, and uh, applied that to answer theological questions. This had never been done before in the church. And the other thing is that he, even though the Greek fathers were trained in philosophy, they didn't use philosophy and human deductive reasoning to arrive at theological conclusions. They relied on the tradition of the church. Well, Augustine also valued the scriptures and the tradition of the church, and he tried to follow it, but he didn't know how, and he didn't have the availability to him of, he didn't read Greek very well, he didn't like Greek, so he wasn't reading the Greek fathers who came before him. And so he introduced novel ideas, and especially this new way of theologizing, which was to apply human reasoning to the problem. And so this is where it begins. Okay. So we have the Protestants with the sola scriptura, mm -hmm. and then we have the Catholics who add to that, I think you mentioned in your book, the traditions, and that would be the historicity and the Pope and all that. Am, am I reading that correct or am I off? Well, the, the, the Western Christian fronima is, um, is a Protestant Catholic is different. So the, the Protestants are emphasizing the scriptures, the scriptures alone. And then some Protestants, first of all, I should say it's very difficult to generalize about Protestants because there are so many different Amen. kinds of Protestants. Right. So this is a very broad and sweeping generalization. So, but they usually agree on one thing, the scriptures alone, the church has no authority. The scriptures have the sole authority. So they have that. And then the Catholics of course responded to that with the, the scriptures and tradition. So the Catholics have a different take on it. They include the idea of tradition, but it's the, the argument really is much deeper than that between them. It has to do with, with also things that we fundamentally disagree about, about salvation. How, how does that happen? And what is sin? And what, what kind of authority is important in the church? What, who holds authority in the church? So for the Protestants, sola scriptura means that there is no authority other than the Bible. But this really doesn't work. And the proof that it doesn't work is the fact that there are 25,000 different Protestant denominations, literally defined denominations. That doesn't count all the just little storefront churches and independent right. preachers, independent congregations that aren't aligned with any denomination. So the different ideas in Protestantism, they're just so vast and they they share a couple of things but primarily this idea that there is no such thing as church authority and the scriptures come first and they are the only authority but the reason why we know that doesn't work is because with that idea you should have unity right if, if the scriptures are self-explanatory mm -hmm. they're the only authority there should be protestant but unity don't. but they're the most fragmented of every type of christian that there is they're far more fragmented than the orthodox and the and they're far more diverse in their opinions. So that doesn't work. Go it ahead, also uh, leads to this, yes. Right. Go ahead, no, you go ahead. It leads to this idea that you, any, what they have, what that has at, as its, at its core is this idea that every person can interpret the Bible for himself. So they believe that they have the Holy Spirit, they've accepted Jesus Christ, they have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, whatever they think the Bible means, that's what it means. And so that's why you have this divergence of opinions. So that static moment rather than a dynamic uh, sort of process is what we're looking at, right? Well, that they see it as, well, they would say it's continually changing and it depends on each person, but that can't mm -hmm. be right because the scriptures have to have a specific meaning. They can't just 
be so um, th that they can't mean whatever it is to that particular person, then that would make them irrelevant. If it only means what it what you think it means, it, it means that to you, it means this to me, it means this to this other person. So that can't be correct. The scriptures had a meaning for the people who wrote them, and they were trying to convey a certain idea to us, right? So it has to have a meaning initially there. And then the church in the Orthodox view preserved that understanding of what it meant. The, the Protestants don't recognize the church as having any, um, anything to contribute really to the meaning of the scriptures because the church has no authority. And that, no authority. that okay. it's entirely a reaction against the Catholic church. The Protestants weren't reacting right, against us. They were reacting against the and the Catholic Church, and frankly, they were right to do it because the Catholic Church was very corrupt at the time, and had a lot of problems. And it's it's not that they were wrong, but they went too far to the other extreme. Rather than just accepting the mistakes in the Catholic Church, they just went said no church, no church authority at all. All right. Before we go into the Roman Catholics a little more, mm -hmm. I'd like you to please explain because you you did it the last time. And I think it's very important that people understand the, the Protestant concept of sin, how sins are forgiven, uh, being on the cross, paying debt, all, all these things yeah. are central to mm -hmm. a belief so that when we Orthodox, those of us who are on the yeah. program right now, encounter someone who's Protestant, we understand the divergence between the two theologies. Right, right. right. Okay, so in the term in terms of sin. Catholics and Protestants have very much the same idea. And this is where we differ from the West. So they have, they come at the idea of sin in a very similar manner. And this has its roots in St. Augustine. So Augustine, um, so just because by the way, he's a saint or even a father of the church for us, it doesn't mean we accept everything that he said, okay? Mm -hmm. Because we're not patristic fundamentalists. Just because a father said something doesn't mean that we accept it. So this is a good example of that. So, so Augustine distinguished between, in sin, between the guilt of the sin and the penalty of the sin, all right? That's totally foreign to the Orthodox mind. In other words, um, you can be guilty of a sin and be forgiven of it, but you might still have to pay for it. That's, that's Catholic. Wow. For the, for the, this is really hard for us to imagine. Even if you confess a sin, the Catholic Church believes that you still have to pay the penalty for the sin. The guilt is forgiven, but what they call the penal consequence is not forgiven. This is actually not even understood or known by many Catholics. I had seminarians tell me, oh, I never heard of this. And I had to say, think, did I get that wrong? <laughs> I went back, I went to the Vatican website and I checked, yes, this is correct. Okay, so let's set that aside and just talk about the Protestants. But they have this idea of sin, right? And sin is an offense against God. So it's a very legalistic understanding of sin. Sin is something like a crime. You committed a crime, you did something wrong that was offensive to God, and you have to pay for it, right? So that's very different from how we view sin. In the Orthodox Church, we see sin as an illness, that we ha it has affected the relationship between us and God. We have departed from God, and we want to go back to God. So we go back with humility, we confess our sins, and God accepts us back. And it's done. You never have to think about those sins again. It's completely forgiven. That's what we believe, okay? And actually, the prayers of the priest, Father, which you know very well, say, having no further care for the sins you have committed, go in peace, right? It's right. as if it never happened. So the Protestants believe that because this is medieval thinking, this came from the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. You mentioned Anselm before of Canterbury. Anselm of Canterbury, building on Augustine and this idea of reason, human reasoning, he said this. He said, sin is an offense against God. Therefore, and somebody has to pay the penalty for sin. Right. But, but no human being could possibly pay the penalty for all these human sins. Only God could do that. But God is not the person who sinned. It's humans who sinned. 
Therefore, God became a human being to pay the price for our sins. This is a very famous medieval work around the year 1000 by somebody called Anselm of Canterbury. He's the saint in the Catholic Church, not, not for us. And he wrote this treatise called Why God Became Man. And this has become the dominant idea in Western Christianity. Jesus Christ, or the Logos, the Son of God, became a human being, whom we know as Jesus, to die on the cross and pay for our sins. That's what he did, okay? So that's accepted as for the Protestants and Catholics. We, of course, believe that Jesus died for our sins too, but that's not the dominant view of salvation in the Orthodox Church. He conquered death. His death on the cross was an example of the depth of humility of Christ, the depth of his sacrifice, which was not necessary. God didn't demand it. It wasn't required because we sinned and somebody had to pay. He did it out of his love for humankind, okay? And by his death on the cross, he showed the depth of God's love. And because of this, through his death, voluntary death, he didn't have to die because he's God. He accepted to die. He, ex he allowed himself to die and he conquered death by rising from the dead. So he opens up paradise for us by conquering death. Th this is what orthodoxy is about. But in the West, everything okay. is about paying the price for sin with the blood of Jesus. Uh, before we go a little deeper and we're gonna open it up too for folks who are on, we got people from Alaska, from Charlotte, North Carolina, from Ethiopia, from all over the world, Africa, my goodness today, from all over oh, Texas. That's great. Uh, before we do that, um, I, I want you really to, to look at uh, the issue of the sacraments. Uh, okay. Guilt through sacraments, forgiveness through sacraments. Mm. Uh, yeah, good point. Talk about good that point. a little bit, because you, yeah, you okay. address it in your book. So I'm not going to talk about the Orthodox. We're going to talk next week about the Orthodox running mouth about a lot of these things. So let's talk about how Catholics and Protestants differ in this way. And okay. I might mention a little bit about Orthodoxy. So... If you believe and accept that the main thing that Jesus Christ accomplished on this earth was to die on the cross and pay the price for our sins, something which is absolutely necessary, either demanded by God the Father or necessary because you have a very legalistic idea of sin, it's a crime that has to be punished. And by the way, in the Catholic Church, they say that sin affects the majesty of God. You have disturbed the order of the universe, literally. This wow. is the language that they use. And the majesty of God has been violated and you have to make it right. Well, Catholics have their way of making it right, but let's stick with the Protestants. The Protestants say, there's nothing you can do. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for our sins. So all I have to do is accept that. I have to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and say, thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sins. I accept you, come into my heart, et cetera, and I'm saved. There's nothing else that I need to do because Jesus has done it all. And when you think about it that way, of course, we could not die on the cross for anybody's sins. The, he's, they're right in the sense that Jesus did that for us, mm -hmm. for all humankind, for all time. That's, but that's their perspective. But what that means is that when they, when they, take, when they say, well, Jesus has done everything and I don't have to do anything, that Ooh. means, of course, there's no need for any sacraments. There's nothing that you you can do to add to that, but we agree. There's nothing we can do to add to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing for us to do at all. And this is where I think many Protestants find um, that there's something missing from their lives. There's either that or they do they think it's just well this is a free ticket and I can do whatever I want. Well, they will say Jesus did everything, so I don't have to do anything. Wow. So they feel like they're resting comfortably. Yes, I've got, mm -hmm. I'm going to heaven. I think that that's a fallacy and that's not yep. what the Bible says, right? right? You don't have to do anything else. But that's sort of where they have difficulty because of the application of human reasoning. If Jesus did everything, then there's nothing for me. So you see the, the problem with using human reasoning to arrive at theological truths. That's Western Christianity. Dangerous. So, very dangerous. Yeah, it's a problem because it's very narrow. It's very rigid. It's very difficult to get out of that little box 
which you have created. But it's convenient if you don't want to do anything else for your salvation. You just say, beam me up, Jesus, right? I don't have to do anything. Jesus took care of it all. Thank you, Jesus. It would be a lot easier. But Certainly it's, would be a lot of easier. Course, that's why people like it, because it's a lot easier. You don't have to do anything. But then after years of like going to church and singing the praise music and feeling pumped up and just trying to stay on this emotional high, there's an emptiness and there's a shallowness because you know that maybe you've accepted Jesus, but you're still the same person because you're still living with sin. You still haven't been able to conquer your, your vices. Why not? Because there's no vehicle in the Protestant world to be able to do that. There's no recognition that you need to do that. There's, there's this idea that if you are truly a Christian, you'll be a better person. But there's no mechanism for doing that. For and so that's that. what the early church had. We have the sacraments. We have the prayer life. We have. It's not that Protestants don't have a prayer life, but there's no way to acquire holiness, to achieve holiness. There's nothing in I shouldn't say nothing, because some Protestants do have this idea of personal spiritual transformation by an intimate union with Jesus Christ, but they don't have the means of acquiring intimate union with Jesus Christ. They simply don't have it because they All don't right, have well, sacraments because they don't recognize the church. It always comes back to that. It comes back to that. Okay. Well, and we want uh, our folks to understand here that the purpose of our program is to understand right. the mind in which we're not criticizing. We're not trying to rip people down, but we That's are trying tradition. to unpack the truth. This is their tradition. Right. That's and their it's tradition. important because, I and, mean, for, for example, if you go back to the parish, I served it. I'm sure Father mm -hmm. Cosadino, the same thing. I mean, at some point at St. Demetrius in Fort Lauderdale, where I had the privilege to serve for what 26 years, wow. as I tell people suffering for Jesus under the palm trees in Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> you have 98% inter-Christian marriages. That's right. What does that, what does that mean? That means that we have to understand who we are speaking to and who right. is coming into the church so that we can better minister to people. These issues come up and they create some issues in families. Let's or, go or to, just uh, today, let me just add to that for a minute, Father. So today I got an email from somebody who says, you know, I'm so glad you wrote this book because I try to talk to my Protestant friends and they just throw Bible verses at me and I don't really know how to respond to that. It's not that, it's because they're just taking verses out of the Bible. They, they memorize one verse in isolation and they just, you know, throw it at you. Or I don't mean that in a derogatory way. They mm -hmm. just respond that way, but they don't understand what we are saying. What did Jesus, why did Jesus Christ come to earth? He didn't just come to die for our sins. If he did, he just could have come and died. But he came and he taught us. And he taught about holiness and virtue. He expects us to live that way. So it's not simply enough to say, well, Jesus paid the price and I don't have anything that, there's nothing that I need to do. So um, it's difficult for us to understand each other. And we want to understand our Protestant friends and sometimes relatives, right? So that's mm -hmm. the reason for us talking about this not to be critical, that's their tradition. And if they're happy with that, that's great. But if you feel like you're missing something, there's something deeper, there's something more. If as a Protestant, you're right. Because the, or, the, deep, the original church, the early church, the Orthodox church is deep and profound. And it offers a life of significant personal spiritual transformation that I don't think that most Protestants have access to. Go ahead. We're going to go to our questions now for those who are both on the Zoom call and uh, social media. I often heard the, the Protestant church being referred to as it's, it's a banquet, you know, faith is a banquet, life is a banquet. And with the Protestant and Catholic churches, you have coming to just the appetizer. And then you've got the whole rest of the table that's filled with the treasure chest of the fathers, of the traditions. And people are not taking advantage of eating from the full banquet. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. We have to open our horizons so we can understand one another and we can learn from one another. And we, as Orthodox Christians, have a lot to share. We really do. Let's go to some questions. So I'll, I'll start with this question because it's really relevant to what we just said. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, so in the West, if the point of Jesus coming was to die, does that mean that his resurrection isn't necessary? Um, well, you see, that, that's a really good question. It's not, they, they obviously they celebrate Easter and they're happy about the resurrection of Christ, but 
I don't know that they would say it's not necessary. First of all, it, we know that theologically it's necessary. I don't think that they would say it's not necessary, but there are some Christians who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That they're even, you know, especially in the Episcopal Church where there was very famous bishop who openly said he didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, of course, that's, that's impossible because if Jesus didn't rise, that means that Jesus had sin and he died for himself and not for for us okay because of his own sins so that's um not a non-starter but the problem with emphasizing the death of jesus is that and not the resurrection is that you're not looking to what is the purpose of the death of christ and that is eternal life that's what i'm trying to explain by saying that when so much emphasis is on being washed by the blood of jesus jesus paying the price for our sins then you're not looking forward to eternal life except as like a place heaven is like a beautiful place that i've been granted admission to because jesus has paid the price but maybe this is part of the problem father that they don't have the same understanding of eternal life that we have mm -hmm. yeah. so the, heaven is not some beautiful place like a, a muse a park where you just go and you're just sort of hanging out or sitting on clouds and you have wings or something it's eternal life with God. What does that mean? We have to be prepared for that. So this is what the Orthodox Church offers, this idea of, of spiritual transformation to acquire holiness so that we can enjoy life in union with God. Not, not nearby God, not looking at God, that's Catholic, but in union with God. That's what we're doing. Okay? Okay. I don't know if that answered the question. I hope so. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Noel? Uh, so we have a question here. Um, how would you respond to an argument that this asker gets um, from Jewish friends saying that Jesus Christ didn't have an Orthodox mindset because he was Jewish? Mm. Well, he had, okay. I'm glad you're, had, asking, you're answering that question. Yeah. He's, first of all, yes, he was Jewish but he differed from the Jewish leaders of his day, didn't he? That's why they had him killed. Because what he was saying was very different from what they were saying. Look at all the controversies. He was saying, listen, there, what should be wrong? What can possibly be wrong with healing someone on the Sabbath? This person is sick, I'm here, he's here. It's the Sabbath, so what? I'm gonna heal this person, all right? What's wrong with forgiving somebody's sin? So first of all, Jesus did not have the fronima of the Jews of his day. I don't want to suggest that he was completely different from Judaism. He wasn't. What he was calling them to do is to come back to what God really wanted from the Jewish people, and that was holiness. That's the reason for the law. So he was trying to get them to go beyond this idea of ritual purity. That's why he denounced the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs, on the outside, they seemed very righteous, but inside they were completely corrupt, okay? That is divine fronima. That's not Ooh. Jewish fronima. He has a divine fronima. The fronima of God. God wants inner purity, not external purity. So Jesus wasn't for, uh, what, I don't know what they're thinking of. He, he, yes, he had, the, he had the fronima. He had his own fronima, a divine fronima. That's what we have acquired because he taught the apostles and they taught us and the Orthodox church is trying to preserve that. That's what we do. So Jesus differed tremendously from the Jewish leadership of his day. That's okay. and the, and the proof is that the, he, they killed him. No, that's a very good point. He, he turned the tables on the entire Jewish establishment at the time, no doubt about that's it. That's right. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Okay. So well, we're not saying that he was an Orthodox Christian. No. Okay. We're not saying that. We have his fronima. He didn't have to take our fronima. We have his fronima because we don't practice ritual purity, right? And the Jews do. Go ahead. So our next question from Maria. You mentioned that Jesus did not have to die on the cross, that God didn't demand that. Mm -hmm. If that were the case, we would not have the resurrection and the understanding of eternal life. Is that correct? Well... <clears throat> This is a topic that is sometimes discussed and it was sort of discussed by the fathers. They, they didn't like to speculate on things like this. We don't speculate. This was the plan of salvation. 
from the moment of the creation of the world, I don't know if you know this, but as Orthodox Christians, you should know this, that before God ever created the world, the Holy Trinity, they knew that human beings would sin. And they knew that the son would be incarnate. That was already part of the plan of salvation. It's not like God made the world and said, oh my gosh, now there's sin, what do we do? They always knew what was going to happen. So they knew about the cross and this was part of the plan of God from the beginning. So would it be possible to be saved without the cross? And the it's very possible. I don't like to talk like this because we don't do speculative theology in orthodoxy. Um, Jesus Christ did die. Why did he die? So was it necessary for him to die? It's not necessary in the sense, in the sense that God it was needed because God is uh, incapable of doing something. It's not necessary in that way. But he died to defeat death. You could say, would, is it possible for him to just grow old and then die at the end of his life but the point is that the cross is the expression of the deep humility of god the extent to which he loves us that he was willing to endure that for us to show us his love to give us an example of sacrifice of humility of love that's what the cross is for us but the reason why we don't really emphasize the cross as much as because we emphasize not only the resurrection, but also the incarnation. And this is something which I, I think that Protestants don't talk about very much. So that's really where the difference lies. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. That's good. Well, I, I see a lot of questions popping up. So rather than my asking questions, we're gonna to try to get in as many of yours as possible. Yes, I'll try we to talk plenty. faster. Yeah, we, no, it's okay. No, keep, take your time, you're doing wonderful. <laughs> Just everything you've said is just, it's it really an opening. You know, it's, it's a one thing to have the book, right? It's another thing to have the author who opens the book and explains what's in the book. That's the beauty of it. You're too kind, Father. No, no, it's the truth. Okay, let's go to the next question. So, uh, Zania, do you want to read your question? Ask Zania. Yeah. Oh, yes. Let me, yeah, my, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. And I hope to get your book one of these days, Ms. Constantine. Um, the question that I have is, what do Protestants mean when they say blood of the lamb? They mean that Jesus is the Paschal lamb that he died on the cross. We use that term too, the lamb of God, right? So Jesus died at Passover, and at Passover on the day that he died is the day that they sacrificed the lambs. So they just they're just referring to the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, they because when I hear that, you know, when they talk about the blood of Jesus Christ or washed mm -hmm. by the blood, to yeah. me, when I think about that, somehow my mind goes towards the Eucharist. They not they don't mean the Eucharist because <laughs> they. Don't I know, it. but my mind tends to. Well, that's think, good. That that means you're more orthodox in that sense. Okay? I mean, when I when I hear that, I think, you know, that's what and we I know would mean. That, <laughs> yes, yes. I know that Protestants don't talk about the Eucharist, but right. somehow my mind get, thinks about the Eucharist. But when they talk about the blood of Jesus, they it, mean. Yes, they mean they mean his sacrifice on the cross. Is that right? Correct? Right, that he paid the price for our sins. Okay, so, so it's that yes. legalistic mentality. Yes, yes. Rather than yes. what right. the Orthodox think about, you know, right. you know, you know, victory over sin, death, and the devil. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Thank that. Thank you for bringing that up, Sania, because one of the elements that I wanted to address with the last question fits in with this. So for Orthodox, we emphasize the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the son of God becoming human. Why is that important? Because he, he uh, deified, he sanctified human nature. We, our human nature has been corrupted by sin. We all sin, right? So Jesus Christ living a perfectly sinless life sanctified our human nature and made it possible for us to become like God. And he showed us what it is that we're supposed to be by his manner of life. So the blood of the lamb by his sacrifice, yes, he's showing us the depth of God's love. And remember, Jesus said, if they did this to me, they're going to do this to you. Mm -hmm. And a student is not greater than his teacher, which means if he's willing to do this for us, 
we should be willing to sacrifice ourselves for others. And we certainly should for him, right? So no exactly. Way. Okay, good. Exactly. All and, right. Thank you. Thank you, Xenia. Thank you, Xenia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, I see that uh, my it looks like Karen has her hand up. Yeah, I Karen see Karen Farrah. Hi, Karen. You're muted, yeah. Karen. There you go. Okay, You're go muted, ahead, Karen. Karen. Go ahead, Karen. You muted again. She's muted, muted again. herself again. Yeah. If you can unmute yourself, Karen, or put your question uh, in the chat room, and Noelle will ask it for okay, you. Okay, here she okay. goes. Go ahead, Karen. I can't, Mike. It's too slow. I, it's okay. not. Doesn't respond. Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Go ahead. Because I I touch the mute and nothing happens. That's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I type and nothing happens. So, um, oh. now I don't know where to begin. I was born. Um, let's see. My father and both grandfathers were Baptist preachers. So hearing yeah. about a lot of this is interesting. Um, some of it it's puzzling. Um, but um, uh, I I will. I hardly know where to begin. I will say this, when Protestants talk about the blood of the lamb, no, mm -hmm. they are not talking about the Eucharist, but I will say this, it was have it was that talk of the blood of the lamb ringing in my ears that drew me towards first, um, a more sacramental understanding of Holy Communion, and then finally, eventually towards orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Because, the, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there is just more to communion, to, to yes. everything than, than I was getting, than I had gotten in Protestantism. Yes. And also I would say, I think it's a fair critique of Protestantism that many versions of Protestantism can make um, uh, the resurrection almost, I'm sorry to say this, but That's an amazing. after. Yes, As yes. In comparison to the cross, I know right. that well into my adulthood, I, I, I got it why, from my Protestant perspective, why the cross was important. But the resurrection, yeah. I just yes. kind of had to take my mom's word for it. That was <laughs> oh. my problem. Very uh, interesting. Okay, all right. Do very you interesting. Know? Those are good observations. Do you, do very you interesting. I think you're absolutely question? right. Yes. Do you have a specific question? Or no. those observations are very valid, really. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I think that that's an excellent point. So the point is, they know that it happened, but they don't really understand the importance of it. As they, so that goes back to this idea that the purpose of Jesus is Christ, Jesus's death, is not to conquer death and open eternal life for us, but to pay the penalty for a sin. So it gets back to what we were saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Next question. All right. Good. We'll go for one more question, I think, Noel, yes, and then I've got a couple time. questions I want to sort of round things out with Bridget Terevinia. All right, Father. Um, so we have a question. How do Protestants explain working out our salvation with fear and trembling? I have no idea. I've never been a Protestant. I don't know. I think they just, what I have heard from some people who became Orthodox is that this they after they became orthodox they just paid attention to all the verses they skipped over before i have no idea how they would explain mm. that okay. they uh, i just can't say all right maybe somebody who who's been there okay uh, the next... one more quick one do we have one more quick one or not noel if not i'll go back with a couple of finishing hey, questions father, go that ahead, i have father. Go ahead, father. father may May I interrupt? I think there's Bernard would like to say something. I saw him raise his hand. Bernard, where are you, Bernard? Bernard? I see Bernard. I don't see him. Unmute, Bernard. Hey, Bernard. Hi, Unmute hey. yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to learn about orthodoxy, so that's why I came on here. But I'm a Protestant and I'm um, pastor, and I've been a Presbyterian, and I've been in four or five other denominations. Wow. Why, why, why I don't I, I, I don't in any way want to take up time and, and argue because I want to learn about orthodoxy. But many, many, many of the things that were said about Protestants 
from my growing up and what I've seen is not true. Like the resurrection, mm-hmm. talk a lot about the resurrection. Think about Protestants. Catholics have a crucifix. They have Jesus on it. Protestants have a church. They never, <laughs> put, a cross. They never put Jesus on it. Why? Because we're told to look beyond the cross to the resurrection. We mm-hmm. often see sin. A lot of Protestant books I read say sin is a disease. It's an illness. Good. Good. And if you know about Alcoholics Anonymous, that started with Christians, and they talk about alcoholism being a, a disease. And, to, and we also have the disciplines for transformation, disciplines of silence, disciplines of, of meditation. Good. Good. Almost everything you said, I learned in the churches I'm in. And, and, and I've never learned that you, that you have to pay for your sins. Like you say, God, forgive me. That's, that's Catholic, Bernard. Yeah. yeah, but since I don't know if they still do that since Vatican II, because yes. I don't know by grace you are saved, which they fought with with the Protestants in, in mm-hmm. um, Vatican II. Like you said, many Catholics wouldn't know that because of what they said about Vatican II. Yeah. I'll stop because I really appreciate learning from you. But I just wanted to say many, many, many of the things that you're saying on your okay. side is yes. Yes. not what I'm saying. Not, not your yeah. experience. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks for weighing in on this. Um, so I've had people tell me something similar to what Bernard said, but others have said, boy, you nailed it. That's exactly how I was raised. Like what happened with Karen. She said that was her experience. So I think what Bernard is showing us is that there's such a diverse uh, variety of different yes. kinds of Protestantism and different uh, experiences. And there are people with very deep spirituality in the Protestant camp. That's why we started out by saying that there's lots of different ways of being Protestant. And he's been in different denominations. Hasn't been his experience so I'm glad that hasn't been your experience, but unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, it is in the in the Protestant world. But uh, okay. anyhow, go ahead, Father. All right, no, that's great. That's great. And we Thanks appreciate for it, us, everyone Bernard. joining, and and thank you to the doctor too who pointed that out. Unfortunately, I didn't see him there. You mentioned uh, the term legalism yes. in the book yes. as a characteristic of uh, Catholic thought. But mm-hmm. aren't Orthodox Christians also sometimes legalistic in the way they approach devotion, fasting, and other aspects of Orthodox life? I mean, is Catholic legalism any different? Yes, that, that's a good point. Orthodox Christians can be very legalistic, and that's wrong. That's not really what Orthodox Christianity is supposed to be about. So um, legalism, when I'm talking about it as in terms of sh- shaping fronima, is this idea uh, very similar to what we've been discussing all night, and that is this idea of sin and guilt and forgiveness. So uh, what Bernard mentioned is that you know you're not immediately forgiven for the sin. That's Catholic. I wasn't suggesting that for Protestants because tonight we were supposed to discuss the Protestant Christianity and Catholicism when we just kind of ran out. So um, Catholic legalism is more to do with. How, th- how things are done within the Catholic Church. It's very structured. Um, it's very formalized. Everything is very developed in, in terms of having uh, sort of methods of doing things. And it's extremely um, juridical in, again, the sense of what is sin and what is salvation. So Catholic legalism, for example, when we're talking about paying for, the, for the, your sins, this is how Ber- what Bernard just pointed out is different for us to, and this is something that we would share with the Protestants, okay? So for example, we talked about Catholic legalism and uh, sin. So in the Catholic church, if you die, even though, even if you've been to confession and confessed your sins, you still have to pay for your sin. And this is why they developed the idea of purgatory. So somehow there's this kind of um, unbalance within the universe that was created by your sin and then you have to pay for your sins after death by suffering in purgatory for a certain period of time. Now, you can also sort of escape that by acquiring an indulgence. And this is one of the big things that the reformers objected to, and they were right to object to it, that you could sort of pay a certain amount of money or you do certain things and you get time out of purgatory. The Catholic Church no no longer sells indulgences, but they still offer them. You do certain deeds and you get time out of purgatory, or you can get time out by acquiring the merits of Jesus Christ or the saints. We don't have anything like this. God doesn't have a big sort of bank account in the sky where he says, these are your sins and this is what you've got to do. Mm. So we would agree with Bernard and with the Protestants that Jesus did everything that was necessary for our faith. 
for our salvation, everything. We don't have to do anything and there's nothing we can do to contribute to our salvation in terms of the universal salvation of humankind. That's what Jesus Christ brought. But we are supposed to do things like, again, like Bernard mentioned, which lead us to a deeper relationship with Christ, which lead us to more personal virtue and sanctity and holiness to reform ourselves, to become better people. And we believe that the church offers the means for that. That's what I think that. All right. Uh, so you're, you're forgiven, but is what you're saying. You're forgiven, but. You for the Catholics, <clears throat> you still yeah. have to do, you still have to pay for your sins in purgatory, the venial sins. If you committed major sins, what they call deadly sins, mortal sins, you, the, you can't pay for that in purgatory. So but all this idea I, is a very legalistic idea of sin and salvation. Yeah. So this idea of someone having your soul and kind of dangling it over hell and saying, behave or I'm going to drop you is not what Orthodox believe. No, but I don't know that Catholics believe that either. I, I hope not. That. I've heard that the other I day. I said, really? I heard that the other day. I said, you got to be kidding me. No, I, I right, think well, that's a distortion. Clearly, we, we can't cover the whole issue here tonight. We can't. Uh, we're that's opening sure. doors. We're hoping to give you the keys through which you can go and unlock doors so you can learn more. But it is up to all of us to do something, to learn more, so that when we have conversations, they can be intelligent and mm -hmm. rational ones. We'll have a closing prayer. And then I know Noel wants to share some things. We have a couple of new programs that are coming out. And we want to thank all of you for being here with us tonight. Oh, great God and wonderful and surpassing goodness and infinite providence, you govern the universe. You have bestowed on us worldly blessings and by good things already vouchsafed unto us, given us a pledge of the promised kingdom. You have enabled us to get through this day thus far, shunning all evil. Grant that we may also live out the remainder of it blameless before your holy, glorious name, praising you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Noel, any announcements? Yes. So we have a couple of new programs on Monday nights. This past Monday, we had Christina Hanegraaff. She has a new show called Created Icon. And that show explores what it means to be a created icon and how that unique understanding provides deeper insight into the question, why am I a Christian? So we'll be talking about the nature of humanity, of creation, how that relates to the Christian understanding of humanity, um, and just a lot of topics like that in the context of modern issues and questions. And that's every other Monday. So the next one will be February 15th with Christina Hanegraaff. And then the other Monday night show that we have, which is alternating with Christina's show. And this one is happening for the first time this coming Monday on the 8th. It's called True Icon Intro to Orthodoxy. It's with Father Dimitri Lee, who's from my uh, home parish of St. Sophia. And this is a six part series intended for students and inquirers at all levels. So the content will be designed for people who are new to orthodoxy or not orthodox or in the process of becoming orthodox. So very intro level, very back to basics, um, plenty of room to ask very basic questions. So anyone here tonight that's interested in learning more um, or just interested in having maybe more of these conversations about the differences between orthodox Christianity and other types of Christianity um, that would be a great chance to ask. That's at seven, both of these shows are at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and Father Dimitri's show will also be a good opportunity for people who are already Orthodox to get a little bit of a refresher course and maybe fill in some gaps in understanding. So definitely recommend both of those. And um, if you go to myocn.net, you'll be able to see all the information about upcoming programs as well. So um, I'll put, uh, um, I'll put the information for, for those two programs in the chat. It's the same registration. So I'll put those in the chat after these announcements, but visit myocn.net for all the details. Very good. Um, and Very then good. also on Mondays, we have um, Facebook Live Adult Education at 12 p.m. with Michael Haldas. Um, that's a reflection every Monday at 12 p.m. And then Wednesdays we have with Michael Macron, Father Michael Marcantoni, The Real Deal, that's at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then next week for Let's Talk Live, we're welcoming back Hank Hanegraaff for the second part of his series. And we'll be talking about why am I an Orthodox Christian? 
Um, and then finally, any questions we didn't get to today? I know there were some people that wanted to ask a question that weren't able to. Definitely please come back and ask these questions next time. But you can also send your questions to info at myocn.net and just note that you'd like it to be asked in the next program or in an upcoming program and those will get to us. So please send your questions. And, and two more, Noel, that I, I confirmed this evening. Uh, Elder Ephraim from the Vatopedi Monastery in Mount Athos will join us again on March the 4th. And two days prior to that, I should have made that known first, there is a new group out that's dealing with religious persecution. And we're going to have uh, four speakers with us that have begun to take this issue on head on. And they'll share with us how Christians are being persecuted all over the world. Those two programs wow. you don't want to miss. That's March 2nd and 4th, I believe. But please wow. go back to our website and you'll be able to see them. Thank you so much to our very special guest tonight, Dr. Costandino. My pleasure, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you all. Thank you, Father. It's great Good to have you here. Those of you that want to stay on at the end and you want to say hello to each other after the recording stops, you're welcome to do that. Thank you for your support of MyOCN. Please stay safe, stay well. Remember to please support MyOCN, which is the wind in the wings of the angels carrying the love of Christ to the world. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay well, stay healthy.